Ladies and gentlemen, thank you to the College of Paramedics for this opportunity to talk today. So to start with, we're going to play a little game. Okay, we're going to play a word association game. So I'm going to say a word, and you've got to picture that word in your head. Are you ready? Okay. Pig. <laughs> okay. So maybe some of you were thinking this, and maybe some of you young children were thinking this, and maybe some of you are still a bit hungry after lunch and you were thinking of this. <laughs> okay, so you got the idea now. So the next one, work. All right. So maybe some of you were thinking this, but perhaps some of you were thinking this. And for some, Perhaps you were thinking this. Okay, last one now. Post-traumatic stress or psychological trauma? Well, maybe some of you thought this. But perhaps some of you were thinking this. <coughs> but I wonder if any of you were thinking of these. Compassion fatigue is perhaps the lesser known cause of post-traumatic stress symptoms. It's a secondary trauma experienced by those in the helping and caring professions, such as nurses, counsellors, police officers, and even you, us as paramedics. Compassion fatigue happens over a period of time, and it's from caring for and hearing about the experiences of trauma th from other people. So it's not a trauma that you witness directly, but it's vicariously. It's through the eyes and the ears of the, of the, of the other person. And this can result in traumatic stress and emotional exhaustion. And it's where we're so busy caring for others that we don't really care for ourselves. And what puts people at greater risk of compassion fatigue is empathy. So this put, is putting yourself in someone else's shoes. And it's being emotionally present with someone. And we as paramedics generally have a, a very strong sense of compassion and we naturally form emotional connections with patients and relatives. For us, empathy is a major resource. Research actually shows that those with more years of service are more likely to experience compassion fatigue. But research has also found that those who have a strong sense of community and good social support, these things actually mediate the compassion fatigue from happening. The problem is that we can't just turn off empathy. And as time goes by, the things that we see and we hear begin to change us. And sometimes this is for the better and we experience growth, but sometimes we experience an internal shift within ourselves. And this can shatter the very basic assumptions that we have about the world. For example, that the world is a safe place. When we experience something which makes us question our very basic assumptions about the world, it can start to make us overly vigilant. And this is where compassion fatigue is really different to burnout. Because burnout's when you're completely worn out, you're emotionally exhausted, and you don't even like your job anymore. Compassion fatigue is related to trauma on a long-term and chronic basis. So for example, I've got a friend at work and she always seems to cop jobs involving children having accidents, whether that be minor accidents or, or the more involved cases. And over time, I began to notice that she began to see the world in a very different, very different way. She began to see it as a, in a, as a much more dangerous place. Her views about how dangerous and unsafe the world was had changed. And she constantly worried about being away from her children and if they were okay. She began to worry that if she walked along the road, if they walked along the road even, a car might come along and knock them over. That if they were eating sweets, they might choke and stop breathing. Or if they were in a swimming pool, something might happen and they'd be in danger. For my friend, the world had become an unsafe place because for her, she'd developed a heightened sense uh, um, heightened perception that danger was around every corner. For my friend, the things that she saw on a, on a daily basis had begun to change her. 
and she began experiencing trauma-related symptoms such as hypervigilance and a fear that something bad was always about to happen. But in our job, of course, one of the things about it is that we never know what we're going to get and we never know what we're going to be called to. And just like life being a box of chocolates, we never know whether we're going to end up with the orange cream or the coffee truffle. Now, for many of us, it probably still is or was um, the uncertainty and the unpredictability of the job that, that really attracted it, us to it in the first place. It certainly did for me, and I like that it's not routine and it's not boring, and that we never know what we're going to get. However, even though I like the challenge of uncertainty and predictability, it's still within parameters. But just occasionally, we get that one job that goes beyond this and sits right out at the extremes. And this could be that large-scale horrific train crash like I attended as a young paramedic. But it needn't be. It could be that one job where we know the patient, where we form strong emotional connections with them, or where we feared for our own safety or felt in danger. It could be that what we're actually attending to is truly horrific and beyond comprehension, or that we felt helpless in a situation because there was no backup or because we knew that the patient needed more than we could give them. Regga Goldberg and Hughes looked into this, and they looked at paramedics' experiences of being exposed to traumatic events um, through the things like witnessing the death of a patient in their care, dealing with the grief of others, or being faced with a multi-casualty incident. These guys did 12 years of research on 86 paramedics' experiences. And there's two key things I'd like to tell you about this study today. The first is that all 86 paramedics had experienced a traumatic incident, with 82% saying that they felt overwhelmed or deeply disturbed by it. The second thing I'd like to say is that 25% of the participants fell into the high range for post-traumatic stress symptoms. So these are things like sleeping problems, behavioural changes, being short-tempered, being irritable. And it's even becoming a workaholic because trauma um, creates chaos. And one way of trying to control that is by trying to work more. So when you think about the prevalence rate of being 1% to 2% among the amongst the general population, a figure of 25% is really quite high. Although, to put that into context, the majority of paramedics in this study had low levels or no distress. And we also need to remember that, generally speaking, these symptoms in the short term represent a normal reaction to a distressing situation. Some of the participants in this study also experienced positivity. They felt more self-aware, more enriched, and had a greater appreciation of life. Experiencing the traumatic incident caused them to evaluate their own lives and to value the relationships with family and friends. Um, life became more meaningful. They had a sense of purpose of being able to help someone in their time of need. And they felt more fulfilled than they did before the traumatic experience. Things such as these are termed post-traumatic growth. So that's where you have um, positive psychological change experienced as a result of adversity. So although some of the ambulance staff may experience distress, there is evidence from studies to say the majority are incredibly resilient and they don't go on to develop any long-term problems. And this is something that's found across the spectrum of trauma-exposed populations. I think this is really important to remember and keep in context but it doesn't take away from the fact that high numbers of ambulance staff are experiencing distress when compared with the general population. So we've got a variety of responses that could happen um, after a traumatic experience, ranging from full-on post-traumatic stress, um, a temporary rise in anxiety levels, to even post-traumatic growth. It's our responses to these situations that first interested me in this area of work. But at the time, there, was, there wasn't really any research at all. Um, 
And what was really missing was something about how ambulance clinicians really felt. It was that emotion associated with having experienced something traumatic. There was nothing giving a voice to paramedics, and there was very little documenting what it was actually like to attend an incident or what their personal experiences of support was like after the incident. I wanted to understand what the impact of this was like for them. And when we link this in with trauma theory and research, we get a much better and detailed understanding of what and how things may help um, coping and resilience, and how we can promote psychological well-being. So after getting our ethical approval, I interviewed six ambulance clinicians about their experiences. And the depth of information they gave me was huge. But there's a number of themes that came out of what they said. As time is short today, I'm just going to give you a very brief overview of my findings. But I'm more than happy to talk um, in more detail about it after the presentation. So I'd just like you to take a few moments to read the next slide. Now this is Rebecca. Rebecca's 24 years old and she's a newly qualified graduate paramedic. And she's talking about her traumatic experience of attending her first pediatric arrest. In asking her about her reactions to the incident, she told me how she felt anxious for some time afterwards. For Rebecca, even the message just coming through on the MDT or computer screen that she'd be going to another job involving a youngster instantly took her back to this moment in time um, and she experienced the same sensory and physical reactions. And that even happened in the interview, which was done several months after the, the job. Okay, this is Dick. Dick's a full-time paramedic. He's 23 years service. He's 49, divorced, and prior to the ambulance service, he was in the military. He also attended a pediatric arrest, but when he arrived, he found, unfortunately, the baby was beyond help. Dick really struggled with the fact that he wanted to do more for this child, but it wasn't to be. He struggled to make sense of the situation and experienced anger, intrusive memories, ruminating thoughts, and used alcohol and prescription drugs to try and cope. All of the participants in my study experienced long-lasting psychological and physical effects, and this was really about their body shouting out, I'm not okay. The next theme indicated a real ambivalence around talking, and it's talking to others about the incident and about how they were feeling. On the one hand, um, there was a real belief about, we don't need to talk, we just need to get on with the job because it's what we do. And for some of the participants, talking about how you're feeling or showing emotions about the incident was felt to be, um, felt to disclose emotional vulnerability. And that came at price for my participants because they perceived that there'd be threats to their identity, their status, and their reputation. They also talked about cultural stigma around discussing emotions and felt that it was a real weakness to show these. So this is an example, this is the words of Vix. Vix is a 31-year-old lady with five years frontline experience and she's an ambulance technician. And she attended the pediatric arrest of her goddaughter. Both Vix and Rebecca talked about how they felt really distressed after their incidents, but they fought to hide their emotions and almost put on a mask in front of the other crews because they didn't want to appear weak to them or um, as a hysterical woman. Both Vix and Rebecca said, um, independently of each other, um, I didn't want them to think I was weak. I wanted them to think I was a good paramedic and that I'm a strong person. And to them, and they're not alone because research um, has also found similar, their perception of what being a good paramedic is meant having control over your feelings um, and not displaying any emotions. 
And it was about being able to deal with anything and, and get on to the next job. For both these ladies, by omitting vulnerability, there was a real fear that their gender, their status, and their ability to do the job may have been questioned by both their peers and their managers. They feared that they wouldn't have been seen capable of doing their job anymore, and they felt they wouldn't have been respected. So instead, they chose only to talk to a close, trusted friend. On the other hand, at the other end of the scale, I had a participant called Archie, and he's an ambulance nurse who attended a horrific murder. And for him, it was all about talking. He wanted to talk to everyone about it. Um, and he highly valued talking to peers as a coping strategy. And he really emphasised about the storytelling that we have between crews and how that plays a vital role in the diffusing of incidents. And do you know what's really interesting? Within the context of trauma, the positive experiencing of social support enables memories to be verbalised and made sense of. And there's real therapeutic value in able, being able to tell your story and just to be heard. And in terms of neuropsychology, we know that the way memories are processed and stored um, is affected by trauma. So cognitive processing is disrupted. So normally, you've got your sensory information which is received in your amygdala, and then it's transferred into emotional and hormonal signals. And the information goes across into the hippocampus, whose job it is to file those into the long-term memory. However, what the research is saying is that in some people who've experienced trauma-related distress, this really doesn't happen. So the sensory information kind of gets stuck in the amygdala, and it can't always get through to the hippocampus. So in a way, it's like a second degree heart block, but in the brain, um, because it's, it's not organized and it's chaotic and random. But we found that telling the story about what's happened can help those memories become processed, be less fragmented, and it helps rational thinking and allows us to gain control of our thoughts. It can also help us adjust to those beliefs and assumptions that may have been shattered by the trauma. But what's absolutely key is that the social support has to be re perceived positively. Otherwise, it can impede the, the trauma process um, of the memories and can increase psychological difficulties. So all of the participants in my study talked about support from their manager after the incident. And for some, like Archie, whose words you're reading now, the support from his immediate manager um, was a bit um, disheartening, really, and he felt really quite let down. For Vix, on the other hand, it was actually her senior manager rather than her immediate manager who um, gave her good social support. And this made a real difference to her, um, and she really valued that he'd made time for them to sit down and that she could talk through um, the job. And it was just being listened to and being given time and space to go through her story that was really important to her. Um, overall, the most important source of support was crewmates. They all said, good crewmates help you cope. And this was certainly true for Mary, an ambulance technician with six years service who went to a fatal ejection RTC. She highlighted how it was the fact of being able to share her emotional experiences with her crewmates allowed her memories of the incident to be normalized. So she was able to identify that she wasn't alone, um, her feelings were valid, and that actually her colleagues had felt similar when they'd had similar experiences. So she wasn't weak and she wasn't going mad. So my final theme was about protecting others. And some of the participants explained that they chose not to talk to family and friends because they wanted to protect them and shield them from the traumatic things they'd seen. <clears throat> and they didn't want to burden or traumatize them. 
But the thing is, family and friends are a massive part of our social support network. So by not talking to them, um, it kind of rules that one out, really. So overall, the most important factor to my participants was a need to tell their experiences and be heard by others. Whether that's in the crew room, in private with a crewmate or a trusted work friend, with a manager, team leader, with their loved ones or someone else outside work. It's social connections that mediate stress and promote psychological well-being, resilience and recovery. And of all the studies out there exploring the impact of traumatic exposure um, on individuals, whether they're from the ambulance service or elsewhere, all of them refer to the power of being connected to others. Um, it's so important. Um, and my study also highlighted that the role of the line manager uh, and their awareness and their attitude and their approach to, to the person is absolutely crucial. But we also have to remember that line managers <coughs> aren't immune to trauma either, so support needs to be for everyone. So what does all this mean and, and where do we go from here? Well, ultimately it's about trying to avoid this happening. And this comes down to uh, social compassion. So yeah, social compassion and self-compassion. And this is a source of enormous strength and can give us resilience. It's about having compassion for ourselves and for others. So what can we do in the future to enhance these processes and better support staff? Well, we can develop a greater understanding and awareness of, of traumatic stress reactions and the way that they impact upon staff and, and the organisation in which we work. Educating people about the reactions can in itself reduce distress. Having an awareness about, about it and having understanding about traumatic stress can help someone um, after a distressing call to feel that um, they're able to make more sense of it, more meaning of it. And it can alleviate feelings like, I think I'm going mad. It's also about being present and offering support. And generally, people need to spend time talking to each other about what they've just witnessed. Um, and it usually helps if the manager can be part of that, because people tend to look to the manager for practical support and guidance. And for managers, it's, it's about not necessarily sending people home, because immediate support is best um, done by the people that they work with and who understand the situation that they've been to. Indi indirectly encouraging people to talk in this way helps to avoid the onset of denial. It can also help normalise distressing feelings. And wherever possible, it's about re-establishing normal working routines um, with flexibility so that when the person's ready to go back into that We need to have a cultural acceptance because that will help us to reduce the stigmas. Um, and stigma is something that's been commented on by a lot of research. Um, for example, the work done by MIND. And lastly, we also need to look at reactive interventions. So that's making time for a debriefing process, finding organisational barriers and trying to overcome them, having a peer support network, and having formal support pathways like um, trim or counselling. So I'm just coming to the end of the presentation now, and the one thing I'd really like you to take away from it is that social connections mediate stress and they promote psychological well-being, resilience and recovery. Thank you.